the great digger who has done more actually for garden conservation in this country than almost anybody I can think of because he has introduced a new and absolutely vital discipline to it. First met him at Kirby Hall where he was revealing two gardens for the price of one in front of the great building up there. Too complex by half for most of us to sort out, including English heritage. And then to Hampton Court, where the results have been so amazing and splendid. So without any more ruderies, Brown. <laughs> Thank you, Ted, and good morning, everybody. I start slightly differently than I'd anticipated. I think it's probably the alcohol. Um, but in reflecting upon yesterday's proceedings, I tried to imagine myself as one of David Jakes's five stereotypes. <laughs> one I could reject immediately, that of the privateer, or perhaps more properly, racketeer, for I lack the wherewithal to qualify. But the other categories proved to be a little more tricky. Bits of each seemed to apply, although I didn't feel entirely comfortable with any one of them. The idea of being a cultural guardian conjured up the vision of some sort of archangel with all the force of intellectual argument. And I also liked the notion of being a creative guru, yet at the same time interpreting the people's past through vulgarisation, but always from the stem of pragmatism and personal feeling. So I think I qualify for four out of the five, but damn it, I'm only an archaeologist. Some sort of intruder, even an alien observer. I chronicle both process and progress. Therefore, can I legitimately stand in the way of change or even continuity when such is my stock of trade? Would I really lay down my life in front of a bulldozer? Uh, I don't think so, especially since if I did, who would there be to record it? It was time for another drink. Next thing, there was my wake-up call ringing and the gulping realisation that my slides were still to be put into order. And actually, that sums the situation up quite nicely. Because in my job, I deal with practical matters. I deal with facts and I deal with evidence. I try to show you what might survive from the, of an historic garden or a landscape and from what period. And within the timeline of any site, there'll always be different levels of authenticity each overwritten by the next. The survival of yesterday's happenings are authentic to then. Today is authentic from now, and tomorrow will similarly be authentic of its own time. This is semantics, and it doesn't necessarily help to identify the character and significance of a site, which is presumably what we want to conserve. In other words, what of its nature is worth keeping or restoring? Judgment drawing upon the assessment of relative values is inevitably a political process with either small or capital letter P. Garden regeneration, repair, restoration and reconstruction happen as the result of our interpretation and our present perception of hierarchical significance. Archaeology can aid the process by allowing us to examine the historic nature and fabric of a site and to understand the significance and value of its surviving fabric. It can facilitate decision by informing that decision. My purpose today, therefore, is to look at archaeology in action and to indicate its value not simply to underpin accurate reconstruction, but also as a vital analytical tool, a tool of inquiry, research and assessment. The formal opening about three years ago by the Prince of Wales of the recently restored Privy Garden of 1701, which his ancestor King William III had created at Hampton Court Palace, represents a landmark of achievement in garden archaeology. Its layout of flower beds and paths, the location of statues and steps, and the character of the flanking terraces with the positions of accompanying topiary are all faithful to the original design and they follow precisely the alignment and relative height of former features denoted by archaeological excavation. 
the use of identical or similar materials to those that were originally employed adds to the restored setting. While the nature and rhythm of planting have been reconstructed from surviving plant lists and through analysing contemporary practice. The result is an accurate recreation of the garden, which both delights the modern visitor and restores the harmony that was always intended to exist with the palace. Archaeology played a key role in the rediscovery and definition of this spirit, and it played a, an equally important role in the investigation and recording of the physical remains, together with their related analysis and interpretation. All were critical and crucial to the success of the project. This use of archaeology to reconstruct the former appearance of a garden is by no means new. But at Hampton Court, archaeological techniques were perhaps more closely integrated into the processes of project planning and design than on many previous occasions. The earliest modern recreations of former gardens owed more to art historical study and contemporary horticultural design than to archaeological research. Often they bore little semblance to what might formerly have existed, as in the popular series of Shakespeare gardens, and we see an example here from Hampton Court. Many of these were stocked with the old-fashioned flowers mentioned uh, in, in Shakespeare's plays. And like some of the National Trust creations, which John Sayles showed us yesterday afternoon, they either didn't prize accuracy or sought it through the interpretation of historic plans and views. For example, by modelling the knots on designs to be found in ancient books on gardens. Used only occasionally in the 1920s, as for example in the garden of the Governor's Palace at Williamsburg in Virginia, Archaeology in these circumstances was limited to the detection of former paths, steps and walls as the means to confirm the accuracy of historical engravings and surviving descriptions. Even then, however, most layouts and certainly their planting remained the idealised notion of the landscape designer. We're dealing with colonial revival gardens that ignore the reality that most of the backyards of the houses in colonial Williamsburg in the 17th and 18th centuries were given over to vegetable growing rather than for flowers. The use of excavation to establish the former outline of a garden to work out some of its salient points followed from work in ancient Roman gardens, but its wider application to historic sites and subsequent development depended upon North American initiatives and British adaptation. During the 1930s, the discoveries in Virginia were the model for the Office of Works here in England to carry out excavations to determine the former layout of the great garden at Kirby Hall in the Midlands. The results formed the basis for reconstructing its late 17th century appearance, or rather the 1930s idea of its late 17th century appearance, for this has since been proved anachronistic. And fresh investigation a half century later has shown that the early investigators probably overlooked surface traces outlining former paths and other features. The rigid structure and geometry of gardens constructed during periods when a formal layout or its historical revival were fashionable has ensured that many related elements survive, though mostly bereft of their original planting and other detail. When structural features such as terraces, seen here on the left at Collie Weston, overlooking the Welland Valley in Northamptonshire, and mounts, as on the right, at Livedon, another Northamptonshire site, when those sorts of features were abandoned and weren't removed by later land use, they remained as earthworks in the landscape. In Britain, with a tradition of field observation stretching from the 16th century, the analysis of such relic features is now a commonplace. Yet amazingly, it's only within the last 40 years that the sites of abandoned gardens have been given proper and adequate recognition. Indeed, they've now begun to be identified in such growing quantity that they form one of the commonest types of archaeological site. Together with the banks and ditches of former canals, moats and ponds, lesser scarps and hollows may denote the existence of earlier garden features marking the lines of walls, raised walks and other paths. 
In many places, such earthworks are the only evidence for a site where other records are either inadequate or lacking. As here, at Harrington, a few miles uh, out, outside of Northampton, again in the English Midlands. The slide on the left shows part of the earthwork, so a very substantial uh, rectangular pond that occupies one of a, a series of terraces that ascend the local hill slope uh, in, uh, in a, as, almost as a flight of steps. And the illustration on the right-hand side uh, is the result of careful survey of these earthworks indicating their original form. They appear to have been created around the turn of the 17th into the 18th century. And apart from a very simple throwaway description uh, by a local historian who says there is nothing as remarkable as this fine descent of gardens at Harrington, uh, there is little else uh, from which we can understand their form. The sole record, in actual fact, is that provided by archaeology and the recognition of the humps and bumps that survive in the local fields. Individual earthwork sites vary enormously in size, complexity and importance. They range in date from the medieval to the 20th century and they extend from earthworks that once provided a spectac spectacular setting for royal residences and other castles or great homes such as Bodium uh, on the left which was designed within a watery landscape uh, in the 14th century. They range from that to the lost features of public parks. And the slide on the right shows the remains of the 18th century ha-ha that was originally two and a half metres deep. That's been proved by selective excavation. And that was constructed by Bridgman uh, uh, around um, Kensington Gardens. And that's the stretch that's by the modern carriage drive uh, in the area of the Buck Hill Bastion. And you can see the ha-ha moving or coming from the foreground towards the centre of the slide and then the outward curve of the bastion. As well as these features, there can be the earthwork remains of relic town and cottage gardens and, and of course there are the larger, often elaborate formal layouts that existed at country houses where the wider surrounding of a designed landscape might contain parkland planting or seek to create a picturesque quality through carefully contrived scenes. In addition to the identification of former boundaries and enclosing terraces, which, as we've seen, are often denoted by substantial remains, the careful observation and analysis of the shapes and layouts of faint earthworks can lead to the discovery of old flower beds that have been grassed over. We can see that fairly well illustrated on, on the left which is a, a slide taken from the roof of Audley End near Saffron Walden uh, in Essex and it's looking down onto the remains of uh, an earlier 19th century parterre and you can perhaps see in the area of grass beside where uh, the ground has been stripped that there are some very faint parch marks, um, differences of vegetation denoting part of the shape of the former flower beds. Earlier planting arrangements like that, given up for reasons of economy, the lack of labour to maintain them, or simply change of fashion, can thus be preserved beneath modern lawns. But not all have been recently abandoned, however, and in some cases, as for example on the right, 18th century designs have been discovered, represented by undulations less than 10 centimetres high. Slight earthworks of this nature may be more easily identified and better understood when viewed from the air. And on completely flattened sites, buried remains may still be revealed, either as soil marks or by differences in vegetation. And here we have two views of an important series of Elizabethan gardens that were constructed within a very short time frame from about 1597 through to 1604 at Lyveden, uh, again in Northamptonshire. They were laid out by uh, a local, uh, the local landowner, Sir Thomas Tresham III, and they comprised a, a flight of gardens which ascended the hill slope from his manor house down here. They ran up the hill slope to terminate in a banqueting house or plaisance uh, on the, the flattened ground uh, of the uh, adjoining ridge. 
And within that sequence of, of gardens, there were several formal arrangements. Closest to the house, and largely obliterated by ploughing, are the remains of a series of terraces which will have given a first ascent of steps. Then above that, with a large projecting platform overlooking those, earlier, uh, those lower terraces just there, was a much larger garden area from which other air photographs indicate uh, a, a, a regular series of rows of pits denoting perhaps the use of that area of ground as an orchard. A slightly different garden occupied the area here, defined on three sides by broad canals with a variety of other earthworks uh, providing mounts uh, and other prospect features. It's possible that the intention was to close off the, um, the enclosed area, uh, and if so, then that wasn't completed by the time that Sir Thomas Tresham died. And then the end of the garden was marked by a, a large square platform dominated by a cruciform building at, at its centre, uh, which served as a, a banqueting house or, or perhaps a retreat. Former tree sites within Parkland can similarly be identified both from the hollows that are left by their removal and through the higher levels of fertility that may encourage nettles or other distinctive vegetation to grow within the zone of rotted root material. In some cases, these effects have persisted for well over a century, perhaps even longer, allowing the detail of lost avenues to be discovered. The great storm of 1987, which we heard something of yesterday, left gaps in many avenues. There was considerable loss, and this happened at the home park next to Hampton Court. And a very brave decision was taken there to not replace the trees that had, that, that had been lost, but to actually cut down those that remained and to completely renew the avenues. A series of engineers' drawings were produced, uh, given a, a very regular arrangement, but being only slightly sympathetic to the original geometry, which in actual fact could be analysed by looking at the surviving field remains, the humps and bumps, the hollows, the craters, the patches of vegetation, which denoted the original setting out and rhythm of planting. And by careful recording and analysis of that information, it was possible to identify the original spatial and visual concept. And that, in fact, has now formed the basis for all the new planting, uh, which is uh, a, a good re-realisation, I suppose, uh, of what the uh, original late 17th century intent was. Studying the species, form and branch structure of surviving trees and bushes can give evidence of past function and use, as we saw with various examples yesterday afternoon. We can identify former pollards, clipped topiary. We can determine previous trimming heights. At the same time, dates for planting, uh, as, well as, other changes in as well as changes in pruning, can be estimated. And methods of cultivation might be suggested through the examination of root structures or the survival of evidence for a distinctive practice, which you can perhaps make out in the murk of the slide on the right-hand side, such as Sir Charles Monk's use of two cartloads of stone laid on edge to protect and secure the trees that he planted at Belsay in the early 19th century. Important details may also be revealed by analysing the relationship of trees to other aspects of the natural and man-made landscape. Studies of this kind can indicate the extent of influence of the existing landform and demonstrate the nature of change at different periods. As well as an awareness of what's gone before, the understanding of subsequent history and its effect is essential if we are to recognise the individual earth patterns. Archaeology is a powerful tool to discover the details of these earlier and later periods, giving a practical measure to the evolution of design intentions. Such evidence relates to the treatment and use of space in particular the interrelationship between a house and its surroundings. I make no apology 
for showing two buildings because the buildings and gardens will have been reviewed as a single entity by past owners. Regrettably, they're all too easily and frequently are divorced in modern studies. Interdisciplinary investigations, integrating historical and anthropological thinking with architectural examination, landscape survey and archaeo-environmental sciences are important, yet strangely still remain rare, not just in Britain but elsewhere. The features associated with past water management, woodland planting, farm buildings and other structures are likewise all part of the local landscape development. The examination and recording of boundary types, for example, and related building forms such as ha-ha walls, gates and bridges. The example on the right is an 18th century one from northern England. Their, exa their examination and their association with the wider layout and grander architecture and understanding of that may permit closer dating of the individual stages of development. Likewise, a consideration of the distribution of traces of ridge and furrow cultivation uh, and their relationship with later drainage and tree planting may enable the reconstruction of former field patterns and the identification of parkland management. Together with other vestiges of earlier land use and exploitation, they have influenced to varying extent the present ecology as well as social and economic history. The quality and significance of a place can be seen in terms of function, in other words, what it was for, process, how and why it came to be as it is, and context, what it meant to people in the past, what it means now, and to hazard a guess, what it may come to mean in the future. It's all too easy to think that a plan or other picture represents the coherent vision of a particular designer. In practice, of course, such visions are rarely achieved on the ground and surviving remains are likely to have been the result of a much more complex creative process. Here we've got on the left an Elizabethan map dating from the mid-1580s uh, of Holdenby, an enormous house that was constructed by a man who subsequently became Lord Chancellor, an enormous house that was constructed in the English Midlands. And on the right-hand side, we have an aerial photograph of the present house, which occupies a fraction of the site of the original uh, because the present house is a, a Victorian rebuilding. But it still sits a, 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 atop the Elizabethan uh, setting. And this is a, a, a remarkable and important garden because whilst there's very little written reference to it, we nevertheless have a, 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 a surviving series of maps that indicate that most of the garden was laid out in a very tight seven or eight year period uh, in the 1580s. There were obviously one or two later additions, but after only about 70 to 80 years of life, the whole garden was abandoned, its features ended up as earthworks, uh, and they are still very dominant features in the local landscape. So when we actually look at the slide over on the, the right hand side, this was the area that was occupied by the house. Here we've got standing rather forlorn in the local fields a couple of gateways that originally pierced the lateral walls of the base court. There was a very large enclosed area called the green which can still be made out in the local field pattern. The house itself dominated or commanded a very wide view of land to the, the west the ground falls away quite sharply and immediately in front of the house a large platform was constructed uh, and upon that platform uh, an elaborate knot, parterre, was laid out. And when you visit the site today you can still make out earthwork traces of the paths that were associated with that and of course those paths ran between flower beds uh, and it's quite likely that there is considerable detail of the original layout lying just a, a few centimetres beneath the, the present surface. At either side of this huge projecting platform, the hill slope was deliberately terraced, and you can still make out on the ground the remains of those terraces. And they descended to, uh, in one instance, a pond, a bowling alley, and a banqueting house um, on the other side, and they overlooked 
Another enclosed garden area, which in the 1580s was largely dominated by perhaps orchard planting uh, and uh, a series of ornamental pools. The ponds are still there, so too as the remains of... Um, hold on, I've got to get my bearings. So, so too are the remains of a mount, which is indicated on the Elizabethan survey, but there are other earthworks in this area here that quite clearly aren't shown on that map and are a later addition and probably date to the, the first half of the 17th century. So we're dealing very much with a palimpsest, a landscape that uh, has been written upon, if you like, uh, and then partly erased and written upon again. It's the recognition of these patterns of chronological and spatial variation and the identification our features may interrelate that's essential to interpretation and successful, and I use the word with some hesitancy, conservation management. The ability of the archaeologist to fill in the small detail of the past, such as, for example, to identify the very simple relationship which we see on the left-hand side between the sub-base of a, of a path that has been laid over the top of the footings uh, of an earlier wall, obviously demolished. So we can look at that kind of detail. At the same time, we deal with the anonymous and the unrecorded prosaic pots, uh, as in the portrait on the right-hand side. And it's this approach that provides a useful corrective, I think, to those art historical schools that emphasise great names and great events at the expense of the pragmatic and empirical. The natural tendency of archaeology to bear on the technical rather than the aesthetic aspects of garden history complements the documentary record by amplifying the information that is provided by the contemporary garden manuals. Historical analysis, establishing when the basic structure of a site was laid out and identifying the significant phases of its development, combined with appropriate fieldwork to determine what now remains, is an essential means of gauging the potential for survival of former designed landscapes and original garden layouts. And in this view, we see two typical archaeological sites. On the left-hand side, we're back at Holdenby, this large and important Elizabethan garden, and we're looking up the flight of terraces uh, to one side of the, the, the knock garden, uh, and we can see the standing remains, now rather forlorn, of those archways of the base court. The other slide, by contrast, uh, requires a, a little more explanation. Crawling through the undergrowth, or overgrowth rather, at uh, Wickley Court, one comes, uh, can come across the remains of 19th century balustrading, which once gave form uh, to a very large garden layout. Archaeological techniques should be applied, therefore, not merely to underpin the accurate reconstruction of specific features, but more importantly, they provide the means of identifying areas of potential sensitivity and importance, often highlighting the tension between preservation and enhancement. It doesn't matter that archaeology might concentrate upon the structure of a garden or the skeletal landscape, rather than the planting that gives it life and colour. The relationship between the individual landscape components in time as well as space and the assessment of their surviving condition will permit a grading of their quality and thereby raise issues for future decision. An appreciation of the practical way in which landscape was experienced should help to frame future development strategies and concomitant planting, which might include the reopening of historic views and the restoration of open spaces. The techniques of geophysical survey are a further tool that is used to define more accurately the nature and pattern of features. In suitable conditions, both earth resistance measurement surveys and magnetometry have been successful in tracing buried paths and flower beds, together with locating garden walls and ornamental features such as fountain basins. The lost elements of successive phases of a garden's history can often be identified. But like other non-intrusive surveys, the detail of their evolution and individual form can only be understood with the aid of the historical record or through related archaeological excavation. Excavation 
is the corollary of accurate reconstruction and restoration. Its scope can range from the comprehensive to the selective, targeting particular aspects for either research or veracity of reconstruction. Thus, it may be used to evaluate the extent and condition of surviving remains, so providing information upon the constraints of a site, or it may be undertaken as an essential stage of restoration. It enables us to identify the original methods of ground preparation, the nature of building materials, reconstructing former earth profiles becomes possible, and the setting of paths and major architectural features, together with the accurate location of earlier tree pits and other planting arrangements, are all revealed. In addition to tracing the development of boundaries and the construction of terraces and other landforms, archaeological excavation has been used to confirm the location and configuration of former architectural landscape features, such as cascades and grottos. Um, the feature on the, on the right, for example, is the cascade of the, uh, of the 1730s at Chiswick House. At the same time, we can reconstruct ponds and pavilions, um, as in the example on the left from Payne's Hill. A number of sites then have subsequently been restored on the basis of their excavated ground plan and the recovered building materials. They include the pleasure pavilions and waterworks that we see here, as well as terraces and other earth forms. Path layouts and routes such as carriage drives have similarly been restored accurately following excavation. Excavation that provides evidence for the original material of their construction, as well as the details of their former dimensions and the previous cross section. Depending upon requirement, the scale of investigation may range from the extensive uncovering of an individual route to the examination of its salient points and key intersections. Targeted excavation is also used to gather detailed information concerning the evolution of individual sites and to provide an outline of their appearance in successive phases, as well as to test the degree of survival of a buried layout prior to more extensive clearance for restoration. Related work in the English Midlands includes investigation at Kirby Hall, where modern re-excavation of the site, first excavated in the 1930s, has shown how the earlier interpretation of the great garden beside the house both confused the evidence of different periods and at the same time introduced an inappropriate planting design. And that becomes quite obvious when you look at the slide on the, the left-hand side, because here are the remains of the original uh, bedding trench uh, off one of the plots of the garden and this is its 1930s reconstruction following a completely different radius for its curve. Examination of the surrounding terraces and other parts of the garden's ensemble revealed several stages of garden construction from the late 16th century onwards demonstrating the transition from a simple layout to a regular enclosed form that was opened out at the end of the 17th century to create a longer view. And again, we can see some of the relative stages in that development, in that here we've got the remains of uh, an Elizabethan culverting of the course of a local stream, that subsequently the, the streamline was diverted, uh, the garden was laid out in this area, and the former underground a tunnel uh, was broken into by the insertion of a wall designed to retain the terrace of the new garden. Later changes included the demolition of, of those walls and the relocation of architectural features, together with further work on the stream, which was canalised and a stone-built dam and sluice were, were constructed, which enabled water to be held back within the garden, perhaps to form a reflective ribbon. Unfortunately, much evidence for the former appearance of the main parterre appears to have been taken away with the soil that was removed prior to its first reconstruction by the old Office of Works in the 1930s. The survival of a large number of clinched nails, however, denotes the use of wooden boards to create a form of cutwork, though its specific design is lost. A reconstruction has therefore been adapted from a design of the period at Longleat House, which we see on the left, and that probably came from George London's pen, like the original at Kirby may have done. With the addition of upstanding elements such as evergreens placed in tubs 
and statues to be re-erected on the basis proven by excavation, as we see on the right. The present layout is the recreation of a typical late 17th century garden in an, an original setting. The processes of gardening are by their nature erosive, and the best field evidence is likely to be contained in short-lived gardens, which are comparatively unmarked by regular change. Or, if they have been maintained over a long period, in those gardens where alteration was accompanied by substantial earth moving, either by importing soil to raise levels in order to bury existing designs, or by sinking the ground to clear the site for new works. This is very much the remains of a relatively single period garden, um, dating from just before the middle of the 19th century at Audley End. Uh, on the left-hand side, you can see the parterre is exposed by excavation. Uh, the form of the individual beds uh, was then used as the basis for redesign, uh, and the planting uh, follows the information given uh, in surviving schedules. Large-scale open area or excavation of, of such sites as these has led, therefore, to the recovery of several comparatively intact garden plans. And they date the moment from the 17th century onwards. And they include designs in small townhouse gardens, as well as those that were laid out for royalty and in gentry house settings. The majority of these sites, however, are characterised by evidence of ornamental planting and elaborate parterres. Archaeology, as we began, um, has been an integral part of the project to restore the Privy Garden of 1701 at Hampton Court. That had lost its original form and vistas, as you can see from a slide that was taken in about 1991 on the left. Initially, geophysical surveying was carried out, together with small-scale excavation, at the anticipated locations of former steps and statue bases, as on the left. They were important, or that excavation was important, to confirm what remains survived. Further excavation of narrow circular trenches around the base of selected modern trees in the parterre as a preliminary to transplanting them revealed the edges of paths and showed that soil-filled trenches had been dug into the natural gravel to form planting beds. Other sample excavations along the terraces located former tree pits and showed that many of their positions coincided with slight hollows and changes of surface vegetation. Simultaneous searching of the rich archive of contemporary documents detailed the garden's original construction, and other research into contemporary planting design led to a convincing scheme for replacement based on the surviving receipts for shrubs and flowers. These encouraging results were a significant factor in the decision to clear the garden of its later trees and to recover the design of 1701. Thus, with the surface vegetation taken away, mechanical diggers began to remove the recently cultivated and root-disturbed soil. The surface below was carefully cleaned by hand, and later features were excavated and recorded before attention turned to recovering the layout of the flat bonds from, William, from King William's garden, as we see on the, on the right. Archaeology also determined the relative levels between the different parts of the garden, using the evidence of surviving features such as statue plinths, drain funnels, and the original rim of the fountain basin. The exact positions of topiary along the terraces could be, could be reconstructed from the rediscovered tree pits and the brick footings for flights of steps provided an important clue to terrace profiles and their gradients. Other foundations uncovered along the top of the west terrace proved the width of the bower that had originally stood there and indicated the nature of the portico that was attached to it. The geometry of setting out the garden was analysed by comparing the excavated details of path dimensions and other major features with information scaled off an early 18th century survey. Careful study indicated that a module of eight feet had been used, which was therefore adopted to remodel the different finishing elements of topiary, sand alleys and cutwork. The paper reconstruction, in fact, fitted the garden with only a centimetre discrepancy over a diagonal of more than 100 metres across the northern parterre. Ironically, the plant remains recovered from the privy garden, like those in most excavations of historical gardens, tend to provide an indication of general land use rather than specific planting. 
The relevant material may comprise pollen and phytoliths, together with plant macrofossils, including leaves, stem, stems, wood and roots, as well as seeds. The difficulty of interpreting the assemblages due to differential qualities of survival and the potential for contamination through prolonged cultivation is further complicated by the common inability to distinguish wild species from cultivated varieties. A broad interpretation may be all that is possible, and while certain plant associations might suggest a garden origin, better information on the range of plant varieties is usually available in historical lists and from other sources. The remains of mollusks, insects and vertebrates can improve knowledge of the former environment also, though they too may reveal more about growing conditions than about what was planted and where. Combined with the botanical information and soil studies involving microfabric analysis and chemistry, comprehensive investigation may show how soils have been modified by cultivation together with the extent and nature of deliberate soil enrichment or other improvement. At Hampton Court, for example, the trenches of the Platte Bond appear to have been backfilled immediately so that their sides were found to be as sharp as when they had been freshly dug. And we can see that quite convincingly demonstrated by the slide on the left. Once opened, the trenches were filled with improved soil, with a high clay content to retain water, and there were also inclusions of finely broken bricks and mortar to render it more calcareous. There was also evidence that domestic waste was mixed in for manuring. A top layer of sandy soil was added to prevent scorching the roots of the new plants. And we can see the process uh, in the section uh, taken through the soils infill in the plat bond on the right. At the bottom, there's a, a gingery brown layer of material which will simply have been thrown forward from the soil that was being dug through to create the new bedding trench. And then above that, this darker horizon which represents the deliberately enriched soil with the ad addition of, of mortar fragments and, and bits of brick becoming more calcareous towards the top. Uh, and then above that, again, another layer, the texture of which was quite sandy. And whilst we look at this, we can see that when the garden was originally laid out, the trenches were dug to a greater width than would be finally required. They were dug 10 feet wide, whereas the final width would only be 8 feet. In consequence of that, the gravel that was introduced to form the paths running between the plots of the garden encroached upon the, the soils <coughs> filling the, the earlier trenches. And in restoring or reconstructing the garden, archaeology has simply removed that part of the plat bond in all instances, or in most instances, therefore, leaving in place for future analysis, if anybody wants to go back and look at it, um, quite significant fragments of the fabric uh, of the original garden and the original filling uh, of those trenches. So it's a myth that the archaeology has actually destroyed all traces in the reconstruction. Uh, of the original garden. In some instances, the composition of an individual soil and the form of the associated bed might denote a particular style of gardening. For example, flower borders and simple grass edges with topiary would have different requirements for drainage and depth, as well as soil quality. In the case of formal designs, the dimensions and layout of individual features, together with surviving trees or the evidence for their position, undoubtedly reflect the original planting plan. However, because of the general difficulty of identifying individual plant remains and how they were arranged, the reconstruction of specific planting schemes will, I've written normally, but I think I would probably say will always rely upon studies of other topographical and historical evidence. The decision to undertake archaeology and in what form should flow from the process of defining objectives and preparing landscape management plans. In best practice, the policy should emerge from well-balanced information upon the historic design, which has been gained from parallel but interrelated studies of maps, archives, photographs, topographical survey, tree and other vegetational survey, together with architectural investigation and archaeology. Archaeological recording is an important means to ensure the proper understanding of the history and function of the various garden and landscape elements of any site, indicating the form that each took, 
and showing what now remains of them. The information so obtained will ensure that significant features are not lost or obscured during any future repairs or other works. Continuing archaeological study, therefore, should be an integral part of future management, helping both to frame detailed proposals and providing specific information upon individual aspects of design, in addition, of course, to increasing the knowledge of a particular site. Thank you. I mean, the, um, the original width of the bed is still there, yeah. and we simply replenished the soil within the final required width. Uh -huh. So I if you can envisage the bed as 10 feet wide, and I'm sorry to work in Imperial, but the gar that garden was laid out with Imperial measurement. If you can envisage that, there is a, a, a band al along the side where there is original material still preserved, still on site. But would that have meant this 10 feet uh, width that the bed might have been 10 feet no, wide because at some stage? No, I, I, I don't think it does. I, I think that they actually dug it deliberately wider to give themselves the flexibility of fine tuning and adjustment. Uh, and certainly when you work the whole thing out and work out the module of the garden, um, it, it couldn't have been worked as, as 10 feet wide. Now, I, I do accept there could have been a, ch a change of design intent, um, but there's no evidence on the ground that they changed their mind partway through laying it out. Um, you know, if there was a change of mind, then that must have occurred before they started to put in the paths and so on. Yes. Can you elaborate on what was it in the late <laughs> 50s? No, no, no. I mean, it actually, actually started in the, in the 1930s. And then an event occurred which diverted attention away from archaeology. Uh, and archaeology wasn't really resumed <laughs> in, in, in a garden context. I suppose in, until sort of um, the past 20 or so years. And its first steps after the war were, were relatively faltering. And it is in interesting that the, I suppose the, the catalysts have started to sort of to, to undertake archeology span in gardens came from excavations in the early 1960s at Fishbourne Roman Villa, where some of the bedding trenches uh, were located, providing an indication of the original formal arrangement there. Uh, but its application to what I would term historical sites, which are essentially are sort of sites from the, the medieval period onwards, um, is a comparatively recent phenomenon. And I think it's fair to say that even though there was some work being undertaken in, in the 70s, things didn't really get underway un until the, the sort of perhaps the mid-80s. The 30s stuff was very large. Yes, it, I, I mean, it, it, was quite, it was quite fascinating and, and it was a typical product of its time, just as I think what, what we're doing is typical of our time. Yes. Um, Noises are quite so, so, yeah, I mean, to, to have the authentic feel, if, if I dare use that word, um, of what happened in the 1930s, essentially workmen were, were set to the task of digging very narrow slit trenches 
uh, at various points around the garden. And if they manage to sort of come across the remains of a stone curb or, or a surface, that tended to be followed not by further excavation along its line, but by probing the ground with an iron rod to actually feel and, and sometimes hear um, the, 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 a grating noise denoting the continuation of that, that surface. They also thumped the ground with a, 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 a wooden pole in a technique known as bozing and listened to the different resonances uh, and on that basis they felt confident to join up a piece of stone in trench A here with a comparable piece of stone in trench B there. And of course two point, the two points are always in a straight line. But that, that, does, that does a slight disservice to the work of the 1930s because even though they may have got all the planting arrangements wrong and they muddled things up, they nevertheless did discover the fairly general form uh, of, of the garden, the arrangement of paths and the four corner plants. Have you talked to them about the importance of seeing beneath the soil things like resistivity and metatomity? Yes. You yes, yes. You, the, you, you were absent um, when I mentioned that. So that was <laughs> important. Because it's quite important. Yes. Yes, I, I mean, there, there are a number of, of non intrusive techniques. But if the, the situation with all of those, the sort of the situation with the phrenology of garden sites or any earthworks where you're reading the humps and bumps is that you're seeing and you're feeling but you're not actually understanding. It's rather like being given a Christmas present, all beautifully wrapped, but you actually have to guess what it contains without undoing it. And you can only find that there is something very exciting there or potentially nothing when you peel away the soil and then of course you are intruding beneath the surface and all excavation is, is destruction and you can't ever put back the, the sequence of layers precisely how they were, were laid down. But someone like Johnny Fields who walks across the place just feeling it with his feet it's amazing when you tune to your feet how much they were careful. Yes, it, 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 it's, a, it's, a, it's a question of observation, and observation is always based upon experience. Yeah, I, I mean, again, you can, you can use the, the work of um, analytical field work, just going out and recording um, earthwork traces. And, of course, it, it's now possible because the technology is available to come out with fully three-dimensional recording, uh, which you can then put through suitable computer software uh, and end up with graphic, almost virtual, well, virtual reality representation uh, and so without actually putting a spade into the ground you might hazard a guess at the sort of a former appearance of something uh, and you can develop a almost a two minute fly past or, or fly round um, an individual site. I think that in terms of public presentation the very act of, of seeing archaeologists getting up to weird and wonderful things either with magic machines traversing the landscape or delving away and seemingly pain, painstakingly scraping um, at features beneath the soil uh, is always a, a bit of a, a crowd puller. Um, and then, of course, the information that does come from that is an important ingredient for accurate reconstruction. Yeah. But I think 
Yes, I, I mean, and, and, and you have, in that, in that sense, gone through a very important stage of, of evaluation and assessment. One more question. Now. Yes. Oh, yeah. oh, you? Well, I was just going to add something, which is, as the Lascar architect involved in Hampton Court Palace, particularly with reference to the built works, mm. and in particular the bar and portico, we simply couldn't have designed it, let alone built it, without the archaeological information. And we, we had to have the dark work done in order to give us the very little um, actual information Yes. Yes, I, I, no, I, I don't think there were any discrepancies um, because they actually are, are, are two different but parallel um, strands, of, strands of information. And I think there was a, a, a reasonable tie-up. Um, what I would like, still like to see sort of done, I'm not quite sure how, how feasible it might be, um, is to actually take a lot of the information that's in the work, works accounts and to reconstruct <coughs> um, uh, a scheme or a work scheme uh, and to actually sort of just to, to try and flesh out a bit more the pro original late 17th early 18th century project management could that be done from survival i don't know i, I think that's that, that, that's an exercise that we didn't really have time to sort of to look at and i, I think it might be worth sort of um trying to look at and and also to sort of to do some more work to reconcile information on quantities that are, that are given in the works accounts um, with volumes uh, that we can now calculate from, from some of the archaeology. But I think you've now really had your time. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you. May I quickly, uh, that is the message for Carolyn Adams before Marianne. Carolyn Adams. Right. Now we go from England to Austria, and we have Geza Hauers, who is the head of the Department of Historic Gardens of the Ministry of Heritage in Vienna, university lecturer at the Academy of Arts in Vienna, and present, president of the Garden History Society in Austria, the author of numerous publications and books, including Historic Gardens in Austria. So we're going to have something pretty good from you, aren't we, Geza? <laughs> I am very sorry that I cannot give you a lecture in such a marvelous English that the uh, first speaker in this morning. <laughs> It is not so easy for me to speak about uh, garden preservation activities in Austria in your country where you have so an old tradition and so rich in activities. So back to the sad reality in Austria. <laughs> in the first half of my lecture I don't show you uh, slides. In the second half, I would like to speak about Baroque gardens. In the first half, generally problems. At first, problems of the terminology. The ephemeral character of historic gardens and parks, that means growth and decay of their vegetation, the building speculation and economically driven attitudes of the public toward the designed environment of buildings, that means the culturally less appreci appreciated open space as opposed to build up areas, 
And finally, the changed social awareness of representation in the rural and ab urban habitat, that means the loss of the display of splendor surrounding buildings. These are the, the, res the reasons in Austria that during the course of 20th century, this cultura, cultural heritage was not recognized as such for a long time. Also, the insecurity concerning the meaning of the gardens and parks since the 19th century. The two terms, gardens and parks, are nowadays quite often juxtaposed and the increasing importance of the botanical meaning of vegetation in such creations, such as parks and gardens, meant that the garden and park as art forms became increasingly less significant. The drifting apart of nature and building preservation since the turn of the century has caused several problems in this context because the originally very positive attempts of the Heimatschutz movement, the preservation of, of the cultural heritage of that country, to regard these two subjects as, as unity. This unity was acknowledged only sporadically in the years between the wars and ignored after World War II. Garden and Park are seen in Austria by the wider public nowadays mainly as a collection of plants, wrongly labeled Baroque in bloom at the minor island, Ludwigsburg and Mirabel Gardens in Salzburg, rather than as garden architecture like in historical times when the creation of space was more important than the role of the trees. Already at the turn of the century, it was acknowledged that if the gardener is only a dendrologist, he is the greatest enemy of the park because he is always planting rather than clearing the garden. Peter Josef Lenné in Berlin still knew exactly what needed to be done in a park or garden. He talked of the golden eggs of the gardener and regarded clearing as a very important task. A discussion at the symposium, the 11th day of preservation of monuments in 1910 in Germany, in Danzig, with the title Garden Art and Building Preservation, had the result that the Prussian Ministry of Culture drew up guidelines for garden preservation in 1921. This, dot in, this, this, this did not inspire a Europe-wide discussion about garden conservation and its methods. In the time between the wars, which was shaken by economic crisis, there were more important concerns than garden and building conservation. Some creations were, however, reconstructed, such as gardens of Schloss Brühl, yesterday we have heard it, in the 1930s. A euphoria such as has been seen in the last 10, 15 years about historic gardens and parks was unheard of between war, uh, the wars. Yes, I would like now to speak about activities not in Austria, abroad. In 1962, the Count, the German Count, Leonard Bernadotte, the president of the German Horticultural Society of 1822 and speaker of the German Commission of Country Preservation, made substantial suggestions for the preservation of and care of the historic gardens in Germany to the ministers of culture of the different states of the Federal Republic. As a result, in 1963, the Historic Garden Commission was formed as part of the German Society of Garden Art and Landscape Preservation, which still exists and has achieved a great deal in the public 
conscience. In general meeting on, of IFLA, International Federation of Landscape Architects, in 1968 on Sardinia, an international committee for historic gardens was founded, which in 1970 became part of ICOMOS, International Committee of Monuments and Sites, which is, uh, which is uh, still highly active. The Foundation Dumbert Noakes in Washington, D.C., which is part of Harvard University, has had a landscape architecture section since the 50s, which uh, specializes in the field of garden history and has organized many highly regarded international symposia. In 1981, an international charter for historic gardens was drawn up by ICOMOS and IFLA called the Florence Charter. The charter systematically deals with the following subjects, terms and goals, preservation and conservation, restoration and reconst reconstruction, use and legal and administrative protection. The charter was translated into many languages is seen more and more as a guideline for the protection and care of historic gardens and parks all over the world. In the 1980s, West Berlin played the leading role in practical uh, garden conservation in continental Europe with an annual budget of approximately 3.5 million pounds. The restoration of the pleasure grounds of the park in Klein Glinike is still regarded as exemplary. In the former German Democratic Republic, a relatively extensive department for the preservation and care of historic gardens and parks was established as a part of the Institute of Building Conservation. Sometimes the restoration results were better than those in building conservation. In England, the leading, your leading country of historic garden and park culture in the world, major projects were started at, at that time. Uh, for example, the restoration of Paints Hill Park, which were only partially finan financed by the state. In Great Britain, the different trusts and associations dealing with conservation play a far more important role than the state in continental Europe. The well-known National Trust has for a long time cared for and restored historic gardens and parks, resulting in strong garden tourism. We can only dream of such high numbers of visitors in Austria out of such high prices, entry prices in the gardens. <laughs> the care of the great gardens of the Baroque has never ceased in France. The park in Versailles is being regenerated for a number of years. Even smaller and lesser known gardens are being properly restored according to historic tradition and form. In this country, in France, centrally organized bodies exist who undertake special commissions such as avenue and hedge re regeneration, pruning, etc. and are employed by the owners of the gardens for a temporary and long-term basis. In the Netherlands, they have tried since 1980 to care more than before for the, their cultural heritage. In this context, the great success of the reconstruction of the Royal Baroque Garden of Hetlo is commendable. Even in Russia, a great deal of financial resource was given by the state to restore the gardens of, for example, Tsarskoye Selo. In every European country, the historic gardens and parks are regarded as an integral part of the historic preservation and the care of monuments. The Commission of the European Union 
dedicated the year 1993 to historic gardens to raise awareness of the architectural heritage. It stated that historic gardens are creations where the combination of architecture and vegetation is of historical or artistic importance and thus of special public interest. This creation is regarded as a monument and is the expression of the close relationship between civilization and nature in harmony with the culture and tradition of each individual country. And what about the situation in Austria? The federal government, government has agreed the resolution of the National Assembly of the State Contract for the agreement to the preservation of the cultural and natural heritage of the world, in which works created by men or common works by nature and man are defined as being part of the cultural heritage. Nevertheless, historic gardens and parks in Austria are still not protected as historic monuments. We are the only country in Europe not to. Gradually, we are becoming the only country worldwide. <laughs> the Austrian Constitutional Court formulated in 1964 a so-called recognition, also, also dealing with historic gardens, which, as a consequence, were taken out of the care of monument preservation and given over to the care of nature preservation. The care of historic parks was secondary. Primarily, it dealt with prehistoric artifacts and the definition of those was narrowed as a result of a carol of competence between the federal government and the individual lands in 1964 to become prehistoric artifacts are only those that are the result of human creation. This meant that not only prehistoric caves with animal skeletons, but also fields avenues, parks, and other similar forms of created nature were now regarded as not human but natural monuments. This, had had, this has had a fatal result for the cultural heritage for historic gardens and parks. Not the, par not the park or garden itself, but who is responsible stood in the foreground of constitutional jurisdiction. An important point should be, should be mentioned, and it was forgotten in the Const Constitutional uh, High Court. The subject historic garden or park is the representation or order and enclosure of nature, but not the substantial natural area itself. The garden is architecture, and because of that, it should be treated accordingly by the law as it is without any exception treated as well internationally. The simulated picturesque or sublime illusion of nature in some historic or contemporary garden forms must not lead, in this context, to misunderstandings. The elements of a garden or a, or a park are either organic or inorganic. Because of this, they should not be treated as an, as an in an end in themselves, but as a means to an, to an end. An all-encompassing way of thinking is crucial when defining a garden which, in conservation and especially jurisdiction, only became known after 1964, parallel with the idea of the protection of the whole ensemble. The Constitution, Constitutional Court in Austria, in its judgment, chose the path of isolated, legally competent consideration when restricting the definition of a park primarily as a subject of planted nature. Thus, the subject is taken away 
from monument preservation. In recent times, the ecological sciences, botany, zoology, etc., started to take an interest in overgrown old parks. A derelict old park creates a special habitat for rare plant and animal families. Retreats worthy of protection are thus in the interest of nature protection. The banks and fringes of meadows and shrubbery, the vegetation along paths and walks are prefer preferably analyzed and should preserve their specific aesthetics. This so-called wilderness aesthetic is a new phenomenon which is seen as top priority for the ecological movement. This could, in the case of Austria, where an established garden conservation does not exist, lead to conflicts. The aim of conservation is to preserve and maintain the historic heritage as a source of past cultural achievements. Because of this, one should renew in avenues, weed out wild growth, repair paths and walks, and regenerate historic vegetation, etc. The intentions of nature preservation, which undoubtedly emphasize that value of an old garden or park should therefore be integrated into a through garden restoration. There are areas in every park or garden which could be subjected to a controlled overgrowth. Compromises and collaboration would be necessary between nature preservation and building conservation. In Austria, in the current political situation, the frontiers between the federal government and the individual states are at a deadlock. The only hope is the possibility of defining a special paragraph in the Constitution which deals with the care and preservation of historic gardens where the Federal Monument Office and the nature, conservation, the nature conservation offices of the states could cooperate in a reasonable manner. This agreement, so not European or ideal, would move, move the preservation of historic parks and gardens out of its current deadlock. Despite the complicated constitutional situation, a Department for Historic Gardens was founded in 1986 as a part of the Federal Monument Office. The department was later transformed into a department of garden architecture. The task of this department was, initially, to initiate commission management plans for parks and gardens and to give advice on, on how to care for the heritage of parks and gardens. Until now, the Federal Monuments Office has commissioned approximately 80 management plans. The size of plan varies from 30 pages to 8 volumes, for example, Schönbrunn. A very good cooperation between the Federal Monument Office and the administration of the Federal Gardens has been established. The administration of the Federal Gardens has evolved from the Imperial Gardens, which has been, since the collapse of the monarchy, a part of the Agricultural Ministry. It administers, among other gardens, Schönbrunn, the Belvedere Gardens, Volksgarten and Burgarten in Vienna, the Hofgarten and Ambras in Innsbruck, in Tyrol. The cooperation with the Muni Municipal Garden Administration, Municipal Garden Administration of Vienna has improved and is much better than in, for example, in Salzburg, where the gardens of Hellbrunn and Mirabel are administered 
by the Municipal Garden Administration of Salzburg. Some private garden owners sought and took advice from the Department of Garden Architecture in the Federal Monuments Office. In 1991, the Austria, Austrian Historic Garden Society was founded, which attempts to create an important lobby in cultural politics. The result of this initiative is that the Ministry of Education and Cultural Affairs organized five symposia dealing with garden history, which found international acclaim and also published an important book entitled Historic Gardens in Austria, Forgotten Masterpieces, 1993. Currently, the Austrian media report about historic gardens. It is not an easy task to keep up the media interest. Now uh, we go to the problems of the destiny of Baroque gardens in uh, in Austria. One could not look at the destiny of Baroque gardens in Austria and the new initiatives regarding their conservation without first explaining what has been so far discussed. Lady Montague, the wife of the British ambassador in Istanbul, visited Vienna in 1716 and was enchanted by the beautiful palaces and their gardens in the suburbs. Salomon Kleiner originally drew the Baroque gardens by hand and later published engravings of his work showing great precision. Vienna was indeed encircled by dozens of garden palaces in the first third of the 18th century. The famous art historian has Hans Sedelmeier described them as an architectonic vegetation which represented a magic world in itself of which everyone in the imperial residence was proud. Two examples of the levish, levish decoration of gardens are shown here at first. The Altan Palace and the Harach Palace Gardens, both situated in the Ungargasse as shown by Salomon Kleiner. Both have since disappeared. The latest destruction of the Baroque gardens of Vienna took place during the time of rapid growth of the city in the late 19th century. The numerous green spaces had survived the age of Biedermeier, but were then uh, ruthlessly built over. Vienna was, however, lucky in the third borough at the Renweg, where a barrow garden island has been miraculously preserved. The gardens of the Schwarzenberg Palace at right, right side, the Belvedere Garden and the Salesian Garden and the Botanical Garden to left of the University of Vienna were all created in the 18th century. All of them still have the appearance of that so deeply impressed Lady Montague in her description. One of the first activities of the Mon Federal Monument Office dealing with garden conservation was the management plan of the Belvedere Gardens in Vienna. It was presented to the public in 1992 by the Minister for Science and Education. It was pledged that the necessary money would be provided. You can see here an old illustration from the late 18th century to left and the actual situation right. So far the two Belvedere palaces, the upper and lower Belvedere, have been restored. You can see here engravings of Salomon Kleiner, the Sala Terrena left and one fountain to right.
Nothing has happened to the sculptures, the fabric and the water supply for the gardens. A concept for the restoration of the buildings was established, but it was without regard to the gardens. This is a totally unhistorical uh, procedure, especially with the regard to the quote by Prince Eugen, which talks about his garden and the accompanying buildings, not vice versa. On the rare occasion that the fountains are switched on, drinking water is used. The highly representational staircases are covered in asphalt so that heavy lorries can drive over them. Most of the paths have been covered in asphalt since the 1950s. No care is taken to preserve the sculptures from environmental damages. This is the reason that the Austrian Garden Historic Society put the Belvedere Garden on the list of endangered monuments of the American World Monument Fund. An American individual has offered uh, $400,000 on the condition that the sum is matched by the quadruple amount from the administration of federal buildings. Not, not too much money, but perhaps an international incentive to speed up the restoration of the garden architecture. In contrast to the administration of monuments, the administration of federal gardens has already done a lot for the restoration of the Belvedere Gardens. They have followed the recommendation of the management plan and the latest results of research. They have also had a very good cooperation with the Federal Monuments Office. The garden director in charge, Mr. Ludwig, recently took stock between 1988 and 1996, 19,000 hours of gardening work and 1,600 hours of welding work have been undertaken. 4,500 asa campestre, 1,400 taxus baccata, 5,400 buxus sempivirens, and 1,400 different shrubs and trees have been planted. Here can you see the bosquet zone, the lower zone of the gardens of Belvedere, uh, to left before the restoration, to right after the restoration. Furthermore, tons of earth, pebbles, and teen have been used to reconstruct the parterre formations. A new irrigation system was installed. It is very important to note that for, ever, for over 100 years the vegetation was not regenerated in the Belvedere Gardens. The scenes of the past are enormous. Irregular and inaccurate trimming of the avenue trees, espalier hatches, and the evergreen yew hatches, as well as the deciduous asses, has caused irregular proportions and blocked view axes. The, works, the work started with the renewal of the bosquet area in the lower Belvedere, where the proportions were restored by taking out the old plants and replacing them. In the central axis, the statues were nearly entirely overgrown by vegetation and that had to be corrected. Lost details in the bosquet area were replaced, such as the small balustrade uh, hatched between the trees and the niches to right. The administration of federal gardens also tried to reshape the sunken areas to their former architectural sharpness because of the drainage of the 19th century is derelict 
These areas were and are full of water after every rainfall. It is planned to introduce a system of cisterns in the future. An exchange of all the U pyramids and cones took place. Directly in front of the lower Belvedere, the turf scrolls were restored. The first activity in the upper Belvedere garden was the renewal, renewal of the 700 meter long side hedge and the perpendicular hedge which had not been replaced since 1866. They nearly covered the sculpture of the Sphinx either side. At the same time, the low wall was restored and the upper garden could breathe and display its beautiful architectural proportions, again which had for years been hidden by the vegetation. Between 1991 and 93, the former parterre, the broderie, was restored in a simplified version. Because the existing 19th century design had never been appre appreciated, someone described them as Monaco planting, it was decided to re-establish the Baroque flower border. The present plan, uh, plant spe species do not match the original ones. The Federal Monuments Office want to improve the planting with the advice of the plant historian Mark Lerd. In the upper Belvedere, the layout of the cuts and the turf slopes were revi rev revised and their architectural shape restored. In 1995, the restoration of the parter in front of the upper Belvedere began. Because of the strong slope of the gardens, the rich broderies were not restored but simplified into long turf compartments, parterre l'anglaise. Two of them are based on a measured plan by Horn from 1768, who was visiting the Belvedere at that time. This plan was discovered in a private archive in Schleswig-Holstein. In the compartments directly in the front of the Belvedere, archaeological excavations were undertaken by the Department of Archaeology of the Federal Monument Office. Here you can see two historic plans from the 20s of 18th century to left uh, uh, probably from uh, uh, Dominique Girard and to right, to right side from Delsenbach. This enabled the reinstatement of the schematic structure of the plan by Delsenbach from the first third of 18th century. Such excavations were also undertaken in the chamber garden in total restoration, including the pavilions, is still being discussed. Here can you see uh, the newest activities uh, in the front of the upper Belvedere. Here you can see uh, two engravings of Salomon Kleiner to left the menagerie and to right the old orangery, both uh, lust now. It is not the task of this lecture to give an art historical or iconograph iconographic appre appreciation of the Belvedere Gardens. This can be researched in the available liter literature. Only one point is important. The ens ensemble which was designed and built between 1700 and 1723 by the architect Johann Lukas von Hildebrand uh, and the garden artist Dominique Girard and the gardener Anton Zinner, built from 
for Prince Eugen in the later times underwent several alterations, deserves overall treatment, which has not until now been possible in Austria because of the various offices responsible and their lack of coordination. Because of the 150 year long occupation of Hungary by the Turks, only a few major gardens were created between the late 16th and the late 17th century. After the Turks had been expelled from the Habsburg Empire, a building boom started in the last 20 years of the 17th century. Among the many patrons of art of the nouveau riche nobility, Prince Eugen of Savoy has to top the list. He celebrated himself in the Belvedere, not only as supreme commander, but also as Apollo and Hercules. Schlosshof Palace was dedicated to, to his merits as victor of the Turkish wars and creator of peace. In the Belvedere, the cosmic order of the garden architecture was displayed in front of his eyes. It was created on sloping ground, like in Marly or Versailles, oriented toward the Kahlenberg, where the liberation of Vienna originated. Schlosshof, here to see, to left, an illustration from 1760 by Canaletto, and the ground plan uh, from the late 18th century. Schlosshof was surrounded by bastions and terraces, like in Saint-Germain-en-Laye, which were directed toward the liberated Hungary. Schlosshof was, like the Belvedere, also designed between 1729 and 1732 by the architect Hildebrand, the garden designer Girard, and the gardener Zinner. After the death of Prince Eugen, his niece, yes, you can see here the actual situation in Schlosshof Garden. His niece Victoria inherited Schlosshof, which subsequently sold by her husband, Prince Joseph Friedrich of Sachsen Hildburgshausen, to Empress Maria Theresia. She donated the Schloss to her husband, Emperor Stephen of Lotharingen. Two other pictures of the actual state of Schlosshof Gardens, not very far from Vienna, 50 kilometers on the Slovak, Slovakian border. In, in 1760, Bernardo Bellotto, called Canaletto, documented Schlosshof in three splendid pictures extremely accurately. A plan from around 1800, you have seen it, shows that the site consists of seven terraces, which were simplified after 1773, when the architect Franz Anton Hillebrand put another floor on the top of the palace. The views by Canaletto could be used as a base for a detailed reconstruction. However, it, it has not yet been decided if there will be a future reconstruction. Here can you uh, say the alterations in the late 18th century late 18th century ground plan and, 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 and the view of the Parkins is not so rich in ornament that in the middle of the 18th uh, century. In the late 1960s, some ceremonial staircases were renewed and the terrace immediately in front of the palace was asphalted. The number of the sculptures was already reduced by 1890 
8. When Schlosshof was transformed, can, can you see the alteration in the 60s? And uh, when Schlosshof was transformed into an imperial military academy for the artillery, some sculptures were sold or transferred to other imperial gardens. You can see here uh, old photos uh, showing the former richness of sculptures in Schlosshof. The actual state, uh, only few sculpture we have now in this Baroque garden. In 1990, the then Department of Historic Gardens commissioned a report on the future treatment of the gardens of Schlosshof. An important request was that archaeological excavations must be carried out. It also recommended a structural improvement but not a reconstruction to the paintings by Canaletto. This was because of the differences between the concept of Prince Eugen and the garden's later fate. The original concept was changed following his death. Some staircases and cascades disappeared in the late 18th century, late 19th century. Approximately 70% of the sculptures are now missing. During the summer of 1991, the archaeological excavation was carried out by the Department of Archaeology of Federal Monuments Office. The results were more satisfying than had been expected. Staircases, architectural slopes, drain pipes, <coughs> basins, and the foundations of pavilions were excavated, and even more exciting was the discovery of paths and plant borders. You can see here this picture. As a result of the excavations, which caused great public interest, the administration of monuments commissioned the replanting of trees on four terraces and the restoration of the slopes from the fourth to the fifth terrace. The restoration was carried out by the administration of federal gardens under the supervision of Mr. Ludwig. A new irrigation system was installed in the newly planted terraces. Here you can see uh, the, the, the results of the excavations in, in the staircases. Here you can see the new activities in this garden. Because the budget of the Federal <coughs> Monuments Office has been cut by a third, the excavations had to be stopped. Meanwhile, a new use is being sought for Schlosshof. The future of the gardens depend on the use which is found. Until now, the palace has housed the Marchfeld Schlösserverein, association of the castles in Marchfeld, and hosts cultural events. The re reinstated avenues, lawns and slopes alone are not attractive enough for a wider public. This is the reason that the Department of Archaeology of the Federal Monuments Office demands a par partial reconstruction of some of the terraces. There is no money at the moment to employ gardeners. The excavations which inspired the imagination of so many people cannot be left open but must be reburied. The, re the, con the, the conservation activities are coming to a standstill halfway through and one can only hope that one day there will be a reasonable, a financially, financially viable use realized. I do not only want to dedicate this lecture to the famous Baroque Gardens, but in conclusion would like to present some which are almost unknown both inside and outside in Austria. <coughs> 
for all of these gardens, there are conservation concepts and plans in existence. Some of them undergo the first positive activities. A little earlier than the Belvedere or Schlosshof, the little terraced baroque garden in Neiwaldeck in the Vianney suburb of Dornbach was built in the late 17th century. In 1690, the property was acquired by Count Stratman and a small country house was built, supposedly designed by the architect Johann Bernhard Fischer von Erlach. The present state of the building is the result of changes of the late 19th century when the Schwarzenberg family remodeled the building in the form of the neo-baroque. From a print made in uh, 1719, we can visualize this garden. In the foreground are richly planted and decorative parterre on six descending terraces. In the garden proper, which is lavishly ornamented with statues, vases, fountains, splendid stairways, luxuriously conceived parterre de broderie, topiary and hatches, as well as tub plants and climbing frames, ladies and gentlemen of the aristocracy are strolling about. They are entertained by the music of a lute player and they watch their dogs scrambling here and there. The artificiality of the Neuwaldeck Borough Garden make it appear as if an angular prismatic structure had been cut into the charming Viennese landscape. This shape was out of fashion in the romantic late 18th century. Count Marshal Lacey, who created the first English park in the vicinity of Neuwaldeck, also simplified the immediate area surrounding the castle, the right. As far as Neuwaldeck Garden is concerned, a completed reconstruction is not considered appropriate. It is tempting to think that the <coughs> print mentioned earlier supplies a suitable model for it, the, 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 the 1890 print. Archaeological research in this region would certainly uh, yield some intriguing information. The provisional decision of the Federal Monument Office requires that the so-called state of cultivation be conserved by which is meant the baroquization of the late 19th century together with this scheme of plantation. Here can you see the state in the late 19th, 19th century. The facade of the castle was simplified in the purest 1960s. A remote baroque garden in Greilenstein in the Waldviertel in the north of Austria preserved until today many valuable original features. Balustrades and garden fences, several garden parterres and avenues, all dating back to the early 18th century from a picturesque entity which will be treated with great, great care. The School of Ecology of the Waldviertel under the supervision of landscape architect uh, Zbiral has been commissioned by the Federal Monument Office, which developed a master plan for the gardens to restore the avenues every year as a conservation exercise by the students of this school. The restoration of the small but precious parterre of Schloss Heilbrunn in the Burgenland, east of Austria, is still being discussed between the owners and the Federal Monument Office. The Federal Monument Office is of the opinion that the additions of the late 19th century should be respected and not be <coughs> sacrificed according to a historic represent representation of 1730, which will act as a base for the reconstru reconstruction. It is natural that 
that the owners of gardens who invest a great amount of money in their, restora in their restoration are interested in the financial return and attractiveness of the gardens. <coughs> it is only justifiable to follow the path of a careful restoration if not too much money is being spent. For most of the Baroque gardens in Austria, there is not enough money, nor the will do, to do something for their, their preservation. Two typical examples at the end of my lecture are the 18th century gardens of Neuschloss in the Styria, to left, and the 17th century gardens of Kremsmünster Monastery in Upper Austria. In the former, a part of the garden wall has been restored, but the garden areas are still uncult uncultivated. The latter is still a football pitch where there was originally intricate garden architecture. Despite most of the depressing cases, one never should give up hope. The first positive examples in Austria give a hope of optimism for the future. Thank you. absolutely perfect timing. So, straight on. Um, we now have Dr. Martina Essenach from Hamburg. Is she here? There she is. The first lady to give grace our stage. She is on her way with a great mass of slides and doing running commentary on your progress. <laughs> and now let us see what we have to talk about her. She is the author of the book on, I can't translate this, historic <laughs> plants and Verwendung. What is that? Historic use of plants in land garden, in historic gardens. And she's one of the most accomplished plant experts in Germany. Well, you have to fight it out here with our own man, and he'll be lecturing after you. So you start now. Yeah, thank you very much. I have to excuse for my English. It is very bad because I have learned Latin, Greek, Italian, French, and a few little bit English. So I'm excited, very excited. And I ask you for your patience. <laughs> and I ask Jan Wurstra for help in the discussion afterwards. At first, I would give you an embodiment of garden monument conservation in German monument conservation practice out of my subjectly view. In Germany, practical garden monument conservation already occupies a more prominent role than in many other European countries. The knowledge about the history of development of these gardens and their modifications is tried to be put into practice within the framework of long-term restoration programs and measures of continuous conservation and preservation. The goals of conservation and development are laid down in a park conservation manual thus providing the institutions in charge of the historical gardens with guidelines 
valid for a per period of 20 to 50 years, which guarantee a continuity of conservation even beyond the change of staff. On the one hand, the guidelines are bending on the other hand, the manual is regularly updated according to the latest development and requirements. German Garden Monument Conservation distinguishes sharply between two terms in development planning. One is the creator's ideal and the other the original. The creator's ideal refers to the garden designer's idea to how he ideally imagined the garden while the original confirmed by still existing plants and other documentation refers to how the garden was realized with all the modifications in the imaginary ideal and what is actually looked like. A historical garden may have been completely redesigned several times according to the prevailing fashion or economic nece necessity, but it also may have been enlarged or only partly modified, preserving side by side or overlapping several garden historical periods. First, each time layer has to be defined and document documented. Then it can be decided if a garden is to be reserved with all its modifications or if a particularly feasible period or one that to a great extent is still existing is to be chosen for restoration. The aim is to secure the preserved historical material even if several periods of garden design exist side by side and to vividly document if for the benefit of following generations. Yesterday we had this discussion. Current public demands, especially for recreational use, must be considered in all the conservation and development concepts in order to allow such a sensitive and vulnerable work for art as a historical garden with all its pertaining qualities to survive through time. Historical gardens have to live up to today's requirements made by the public. Therefore, any study of the fundamentals of garden monument conservation has to include a usage analysis in order to determine in the demands the users actually make on the gardens and the kind of wear and tear which can be expected. There is no sense in restoring details which will not be accepted by the public or which will be destroyed through the use of the garden since this would also spoil the general ease aesthetic appearance. Temporary constructions and makeshift solutions of the garden designer must also be identified and interpreted for what they are. When restoring a garden, these makeshift solutions can normally be dispensed with. In many cases where the original structures of isolated parts of a historical garden are completely destroyed and the original design or that of later historical periods cannot be restored, unpretentious modern designs should be integrated into the historical context instead. Many individual questions keep arising concerning the management of historical material. In general, there are no textbook answers to these questions, and thus the landscape designer has to find individual solutions. Therefore, I would like to give an overview of new investigation methods of garden monument conservation, which go beyond studying archives and art history sources. <laughs>
these methods have been successfully put into practice first in Hessen in Germany, then by the Environmental Protection Agency in Hamburg, and have to a large extent conciliated the differences between environmental protection and garden monument conservation. The resulting findings can be employed in two different fields. At first, the use of historical plants and the naturalization of wild, old ornamental plants which are no longer available on the market pose a specific problem. Historical gardens are a refuge for historical ornamental plants. Originally, mapping the flora of wild plant communities served the sole purpose of providing an inventory of rare and endangered species from the environmentalist's point of view. At second, at the same time, studies of flora and vegetation serve the preservation of historical evidence. No longer existing garden structures can partly be deducted from the vegetation of the sites, thus supporting archived documents, or if there are no historical documents, adding pieces to the overall picture of the historical garden. Mapping the flora and vegetation also serves the purpose of pointing out restoration measures, reconciling these two different problems on the basis of a comparison between the historical and the actual state and taking into account the alterations that had occurred in the course of time and of developing a long-term concept for garden conservation and development which meets ecological, garden historical and aesthetic requirements. At the same time, the great recreational value of historical gardens are not forgotten. Introduction to the topic. Historical garden and parks constitute an independent category in the field of cultural monuments. The methods of study in this category have been taken from related fields of science and are being presently modified and developed further by garden monument conservationists. There are archaeology, art history, plant sociology, vegetation studies, paleobotany and dendrochronology. Historical gardens and parks are living monuments. That is to say they have a dynamic force of their own. The attendant development and modifications of the plantings belong to the main structuring elements and must be taken into account in the conservation and development of a garden in an historical sense. There is no desire for static imagine in landscape gardens as opposed to geometrical parts of earlier centuries where the ideal was a state unaltered by grow. In landscape gardens, the successive changes of vegetation and natural grow constitute components of an idealized imit imitation of nature. Knowledge of the potential development of not only the natural plantings, but also and in particular the artificial initial plantings of ornamental plants is not only essential for conservation and cultivation, but in retrospect also enables statements about the history of development of the garden and park.